Hi, I'm Sherilyn Smith, a pediatric infectious disease doctor at the University of Washington. And in this video, we'll be talking about varicella zoster virus, or VZV, an important viral pathogen that has unique clinical characteristics. We'll explore how VZV causes disease, how the immune system works to control infection, and what happens when the immune system isn't effective. Here are the learning objectives to discuss the pathogenesis of VZV infection, and describe how T-cell memory affects disease manifestations. These pictures show the same rash, the same virus, two diseases, chickenpox or varicella, and shingles or zoster. VZV illustrates the hallmark feature of the herpes virus family, latency, which is the establishment of lifelong infection with this virus. This is the course map showing where VZV is. VZV is a DNA virus and a member of the herpes virus family. This figure shows the typical structure of the herpes virus virion. It is an alpha herpes virus and is similar to herpes simplex virus 1 or 2, which are the other members of the alpha herpes virus subgroup. This table reviews the key characteristics of the herpes virus family. As you can see, herpes simplex virus and VZV share important characteristics. The alpha herpes virus have short reproductive cycles, and when the virus replicates, it induces destruction of infected cells by lysis and apoptosis. Cell-to-cell -cell spread occurs rapidly, and a key feature of this family is establishment of long-term infection or latency in the sensory nerve ganglia. These are important definitions that describe different types of viral infection. Symptomatic infection occurs when a pathogen infects a patient who then develops symptoms such as fevers or physical exam findings such as a rash. The specific symptoms or signs varies with the pathogen. Asymptomatic infection occurs when a pathogen infects a patient and there are no symptoms. These next three terms describe different stages of herpes virus infections. Primary infection is the first time a patient encounters and is infected with the virus. Latent infection is persistence of the virus, but it isn't replicating. The patient usually has no symptoms. Reactivation is renewed viral replication that often is accompanied by symptoms. So I want to tell a story about primary infection with BZV. This is a very cute 18-month-old boy who was previously healthy and developed a fever to 38.5 on the first day of his illness. And he didn't play much as usual, and that was his only symptom. The next day, he developed a raised red rash on his stomach and chest. You can see this in the picture. Throughout the day, he developed more and more of the same rash, and he began scratching the bumps. He did go to a friend's house who had chicken pox two weeks before the rash developed. I want to use this story to help frame how VZV causes disease. This figure is the time course of primary varicella zoster infection. The first step is infection of the epithelial cells of the respiratory tract or conjunctiva depending on where the virus is inoculated. There is replication of the virus in the upper airway and regional lymph nodes and subsequent primary viremia and secondary infection of lymphocytes and nerve cells. This is important because these are the sites of latent infection. Additional replication and secondary viremia then occurs with infection of the skin. The time course of this process is between 10 and 21 days, or the incubation period between exposure or infection and disease. So let's correlate uh, where patients get symptoms and what's going on with the virus. As you can see, uh, most of the initial viral infection is asymptomatic, and it isn't until the secondary viremia that the patient becomes symptomatic. What is missing is how the patient's immune system is working to control infection during the asymptomatic period. So VZV has evolved to evade the immune system in order to limit the effects of the adaptive immune system, primarily the T, CD8 T cells that recognize antigens presented on MHC class 1 molecules. The virus does this by downregulating the expression of MHC class 1 molecules on the cell it infects. However, this evolution also allows NK cells to respond to the primary viral infection. As you can see from the cartoon, in uninfected cells, the MHC class 1 molecules engage the inhibitory receptors, keeping the NK cells from lysing other cells. 
once the MHC class 1 molecule is gone, the inhibitory receptor is gone, the NK, NK cell is activated, and the infected cell is lysed. Viral infection inhibits MHC class 1 expression and thus turns on NK activating signals. Another important response to viral infections are interferons. Interferon alpha comes later in the pathogenesis of disease and is locally produced in the skin. This molecule has direct antiviral properties, which include inhibition of viral protein synthesis and viral gene expression that leads to decreased virion assembly and degradation of viral RNA. Uh, collectively, these processes lead to viral killing and it helps limit disease. So the previous phases helped limit viral replication, but ultimately it's the adaptive immune response that is responsible for controlling infection. The antigen-specific T-cell response occurs when the virus is replicating in the skin. This vigorous response limits viral replication that can happen as a result of the secondary viremia in other organs like liver, lungs, and brain. In addition, the presence of memory T-cells prevents reactivation of the virus that becomes latent in the sensory nerve ganglia. The humoral immune system also has an important role if the patient is re-exposed to BCV. Circulating antibodies can bind a virus and clear it from the circulation before it causes disease. This schematic outlines which parts of the immune response appear at different phases during primary infection. As you can see, the adaptive immune system begins to respond early, but it's not able to completely control infection until the secondary viremia and skin infection occurs. So let's talk about what happens after pr the primary infection is controlled. This patient is a 52-year-old man who is well except for diabetes. He noticed that he had increasing fatigue and had to leave work early because he didn't feel well. He began having pain on his right chest with light touch, and two days later he noticed a new rash on his chest, which, seemed to, which is seen in the photo. This rash eventually resolved over the next two weeks, but the skin was still very tender to touch. This patient has shingles or zoster, the disease that happens when VZV reactivates. So remember back to how varicella infection occurs and focus on the primary viremia and infection of the nerve cells shown here. This is the key step in the pathogenesis of varicella that results in zoster that this patient has. The virus persists in a latent um, phase until the immune surveillance by the T cells is not effective and the virus starts to replicate. As I mentioned, VZV has evolved to find a niche within the body that allows for persistent infection, infection of immune privileged sites. So what is an immune privileged site? It is defined as tissues that are in part protected from the immune response because inflammation in these sites can result in death or significant morbidity of the host. The brain, the eyes, testes, placenta, and fetus are all immune privileged sites. Herpes viruses commonly infect immune privileged sites like the nerves, which is one reason they're able to develop latency. So why do people develop shingles? The virus and the immune system are in balance throughout people's life. Reactivation of latent VZV is prevented by memory T cells that were generated during the primary infection. As we age, T cell memory in general and anti-VZV memory declines. When the number and function of memory T cells fall below a critical threshold, VZV reactivation occurs. This reactivation and development of disease boosts anti-VZV immunity, thus making recurrent shingles rare unless the patient has an underlying immune problem like cancer or HIV. So let's put this all together. During primary viremia, VZV infects nerve cells and becomes latent or inactive in the sensory nerve ganglia as shown in the picture. A ganglion is a collection of nerve cells that serves as a communication node between the peripheral and central nervous system. Since this is a junction between both parts of the nervous system, the virus can cause disease in both places in susceptible hosts. Shingles or zoster results from viral particles in a single sensory ganglion switching from their latent state to their active state. This switch in herpes uh, simplex virus is well understood, but not so well understood for BZV. 
You can see in this cartoon that after the virus starts to replicate, it travels from the sensory ganglia to the peripheral nerves to the skin. The virus continues to replicate and the characteristic rash emerges. The rash occurs in a dermatomal distribution. A dermatome is an area of skin supplied by one spinal nerve. Since the nerves are involved, pain or change in sensation is part of the clinical syndrome. So now let's talk about what happens when the immune system isn't effective. Jessica is a six-year-old girl with acute lymphoblastic leukemia who has been receiving treatment for about four months. She came into the emergency room because she developed fevers to 40 degrees centigrade and over the last two hours has had more difficulty breathing, had right-sided abdominal pain and a rash that her mom had noted yesterday on her back and stomach but has rapidly spread in the last six hours. A friend had visited 10 days right ago, right before developing chickenpox, but Jessica had been immunized before she got ill, so her aunt and uncle didn't think she would get sick. This picture is her skin after she was in the hospital for two days. So going back to the pathogenesis of primary infection and how the immune system works, if T cells are not working or absent, as would happen in a patient with cancer, the virus can replicate and spread to other organs, continuing, continue to replicate and cause disease, such as hepatitis and liver failure, pneumonia, and encephalitis. So based on what you know of the immune response to VZV, high-risk groups are patients with T-cell absence. These patients develop disseminated disease, even with reactivation of VZV. As I outlined before, T-cell dysfunction is also a risk factor for development of shingles, not only in older patients, but in others with T-cell dysfunction, like patients with rheumatoid arthritis. In summary, VZV is a DNA virus that causes two distinct clinical syndromes, varicella or chickenpox and zoster or shingles. It becomes latent in sensory nerves, illustrating a key aspect of the alpha herpes viruses. Both the innate and adaptive immune systems are important for control of infection. NK cells and interferon alpha are key components of the innate immune response. VZV-specific T cells develop during secondary viremia where they control primary infection and prevent reactivation of latent virus.